Konami's Wild World 1 and 2, SOS from Parsley Castle, for the Famicom, both released 1988 and 1991 respectively. This very series revolves around Konami Man, a character who's made cameos as either a power-up or a supporting character in various Konami fare. Anyways, let's dive right into those buckaroos! The main plot of YY World is as follows. We're introduced to Professor Cinnamon from the Twin Bee, aka Stinger series, informing us of an SOS involving the total extinction of the title planet due to the devious efforts of one Walder. God knows who the fuck he is. However, a transmission comes in from our key protagonist, Konami Man. And out he comes to respond to said crisis. Alongside him, a newly engineered gynoid partner has been enlisted by Professor Cinnamon, namely Konami Lady, aka Konami Girl, to traverse their way through and rescue six missing Konami icons, whom I'll get to momentarily, and exterminate the ever-loving shit out of the aforementioned Walder. On to the basic gameplay and controls. Upon starting, you're treated to picking either one or two players. In my case, I'm definitely going with one, because I'm usually a trooper when it comes to super difficult and or super obscure choices. Nothing personal. Followed by a choice of three doors, the third of which you're forbidden to enter until you saved all six characters. As for the first two doors, door number one leads back to the intro lab, where you can have Dr. Cinnamon's brother, Spice, aka the other Simon, not to be confused with the vampire hunter character I'm about to mention soon, resurrect any character within the party for a hundred bullets. Door number two, however, leads us to six different universe-themed stages in which you're tasked with saving their respective starring characters. You've got Simon Belmont from Castlevania for his world, Goemon, otherwise known as Kitty Ink from the Legend of the Mystical Ninja series, in Feudal Japan, aka Edo, the Goondocks in Astoria, Oregon, where Mikey Walsh is held, was from a short-lived series of games based on the Donner film The Goonies by Warner Brothers and Amblin, portrayed by Sean Astin, the Big Apple where King Kong is held, who actually had his own game, which Konami also made, King Kong Lives, or King Kong 2 as it's called in Japan, Raging Megaton Punch, based on the De Laurentiis film sequel of the same name, released a decade after its 70s remake-slash-predecessor released by Paramount. The Underworld, aka simply HELL, obviously, where Fuma from his own game, Getsu Fumaden, as I mentioned in my Turtles review, is being held And finally, Easter Island, where Moai from the Gradius series is being held captive. Each character has their own specific abilities, attributes, and secondary weapons, the latter of which take up a certain number of bullets, if hell in most cases just one. Your basic controls involve using the D-pad to move your character left and or right, obviously, and or traverse upward and or downward via sets of stairs, similar to the Castlevania series. Enter the three main doors by pushing down, or for certain game areas, up, switching characters on the fly by using up and A simultaneously, and even enabling or disabling your character's secondary weapon by using down and A simultaneously. Upon warping to a certain stage, you're treated to wiping out every single enemy in your way whilst collecting hearts, small or big, for energy, and bullets for a character's secondary weapon, as mentioned before, which gets repetitive after a while. For instance, Konami Man and Konami Lady both have their zappers, which can be found in two differentiating universes with a specific item to be mentioned later. You even have to track down other necessary items in order for the Konami gang to prevail. A magical suit of armor for extra defense, a superhero mantle slash cape for both Konami Man and Konami Lady to fly, even hover through the most narrow spaces, just simply hold A to activate it, and in order for them to swap back to walking, just simply make them land. A rice ball for automatically recharging the party's health meters, mystery treasure chests which mostly contain hearts. Of course, you definitely need Goemon to open them up a potion to automatically refill a single character's life, and even the Gradius-style power capsule for increased attack power. In both the Edo and Goondock stages, there are three different bonus betting opportunities, all of which I'd be fully aware of if I were you. The riskiest hell outcomes are much more substantial than what you'll end up with. One's a slot machine in which you have to line up a group of pictures, Sonic too much, resulting in either a bonus amount of bullets added, or total zilch. A two-tier dice slot system where you have to guess the type of betting number based on the total of dots, odd or even, similar to the opening scene in Big Trouble in Little China, resulting in either having your overall total of bullets doubled or reduced by half. And finally, a card game in which you have to pick the right one, to be precise, the Ace of Spades, resulting in either your character's energy being refilled or reduced by half. Hell, his or her ass might just end up being wasted as shit. 
The enemies range from a specific group, depending on which stage you're in, and based on a specific game's universe, like for Castlevania, there's zombies, blobs, bats, what have us. And then we've got random obakegos, rogue monks, kimono jerk-offs, and even a fucking flying dragon. For the goondocks, there's random sea life. Crabs, walruses, octopi, jellyfish, anemones, spores, eyeballs, killer polar bears, fire-breathing dinosaurs, and even magma fragments. In the Big Apple, you've got futuristic enemies like floaters, two types of mecha apes, hoppers, giant floating electrocutor machines, not to mention bombers, and even the gigantic versions of the gutters from the Gradius series. For the underworld, you've got other apparitions and other weird-ass creatures, including skeleton horses, snake women, demon heads, hawkmen, skeletons with whips, living flames, sword knights, mastheads, and other miscellaneous beings. And finally, for Easter Island, the Moai world, if you will, there's scorpions, wasps, mule men, monstrous earth elementals, and even flame elementals, both green and red dragons, and even various types of Moai. Following those series of confrontations, you then have to face a boss, in the case of some stages, and most of them either turn out to be a pushover, or a shameless, ravenous bastard, and get the key to rescue your captive upon wiping its ass the fuck out. After warping back to the lap from the pod at the beginning, you go to another stage and go through the same goddamn routine. But it ain't over yet! Oh shit no! Bear in mind the unreachable items needed, as pictured here. Should the entire party get nailed, you have to start all over with only Konami Man and Konami Lady. There's even a password system which, unless you understand Japanese, much like yours truly, I strongly suggest jotting down every character precisely in case you decide to continue at any point, like most long-ass adventure RPG platformers out there, obviously. Upon rescuing all six characters and racking up every necessary item throughout, behind Door 308's two ships for the two-part final confrontation to fly within, Vic Viper from the Gradius series, or Twinbee, aka the Stinger, the first part is composed of a standard top view shmup scene from Earth all the way to the cosmos, in the style of a hybrid between Life Force and Twinbee. You can actually switch between the two at will by pushing select, though I could never find a good opportunity for it, nothing personal. And take note, you're only given one chance. If either ship gets obliterated way too many times, you have to go back and get the rest of the whole goddamn party revitalized from the ground up! As for the second part, well, I'll leave that up to everyone to discover since I propose to avoid spoiling way too many details. Bottom line, as monotonous and time-consuming as the gameplay scheme is, it's actually nothing short of gratifying. Same story with the controls, though with due integrity are a trifle baffling in terms of avoiding projectiles and the hit-slash-collision detection of some characters. Challenge-wise, like most kick-ass side-scrolling action-adventure platformers, this and the next sequel that's up for discussion start out as a leisurely milk run. You know, nothing to it, providing us firsthand with what we're up against. All well and good, yada yada. But as you progress, HOLY FUCKING SHIT DOES THE BARBARITY KICK IN! It's not just the bosses you face at the end, oh fuck no. There's also a multitude of hazards to keep a sharp eye out for, just like in the Castlevania series and even Getsu Fumaden. For instance, even if you attempt to jump down one screen from where you traversed up the stairs, your character kisses the canvas flat out! And even the habitual backtracking through certain stages and retrieving those aforestated unreachable items, despite how banal those might turn out to be, they're actually advantageous even for a second trip before reaching the final series of incidents. In terms of graphics, for an 88 Famicom game, the visuals aren't too damn decrepit. In fact, they're actually a spectacle far beyond all means of description. It's not only the sprites of every familiar character and or the enemies they face, most of the backgrounds and environmental elements are well done, despite some minor grips with the aforementioned collision detection. Music and sound-wise, composed by Shinya Sakamoto aka Rusher, Shigemasa Matsuo, and Atsushi Fujio, aka Damien Fujio. Aside from a few original tracks, most of the familiar characters' tunes are heard every time you switch to them, like we've got the first stage theme from Castlevania for Simon, Vampire Killer, the overall theme from Getsu Fumaden for Fuma, the basement theme from Goonies 2 for Mikey, the Ganbari Goemon theme for Kitty Ying, aka Goemon, and so on. As for the final stage boss, again, I'll leave that up to everybody, since I don't want to spoil too many details. Haha, <laughs> I was just fucking with everyone. 
It's actually from the first Contra game, which didn't get ported to the NES and or the Famicom until a month, if less, after this game, both in the US and Japan, and not long after in Germany where it's renamed Protector. As for the sound effects, they're not too damn shabby either, though, as we'd expect, they can get rather tedious after a while. In terms of replayability, now I'm not stating necessarily that there isn't any whatsoever. If you consider yourself a diehard Konami addict and or fan, like yours truly, and are hungry for long-winded adventures, and even habitual item discoveries and enemy confrontations, you'll be begging to dive back into both this and the next entry like your goddamn dear life depended on it. And about that password system, I'd refer back to what I mentioned earlier if I were you. At least it's not super long, unlike, say, the infamous Who Framed Roger Rabbit by LJN and Rare. Besides, should you decide or intend to beat YY World, the average duration should come to under 2 hours, between approximately an hour and 30 to 45 minutes tops. Exhibit B, YY World 2, SOS from Parsley Castle. So the story is set not too long after the event in the previous YY World game. A new entity arises in the form of a powerful yet demented magician known as Waruman, who, like his ancestor before him, has conquered the title dimension while resurrecting most of their once annihilated disciples. To make matters worse, he's even captured the sole heiress to the throne of Parsley Castle, not to mention the sole ruler of YY World, Princess Herb, thus whisking themselves away to the darkest reaches of space. Meanwhile, Professor Cinnamon, after making a safe escape from grave imminent danger, along with a random group of tourists, finally gets around to dispatching his new, secretly developed super robot, complete with an integral transformation circuit, hence the four different teams yet to be discussed, namely Rickle, to once again combat the chaotic, unpredictable, not to mention deranged as Sin douchebag sorcerer, and make things right in YY World yet again. Not much to the story in full honesty, but it's definitely riveting, considering it's no Ninja Gaiden, mind you. Getting to the basic gameplay controls, almost unlike the previous YY World game, we're treated to four differentiating transformation combo teams at the start, half of which involve the usual Goemon, aka Kid Ying, and the other half, the Biomiracle Infant Upa from his own game whereas three other characters round out their respective miniature leaders, Bill Riser from the Contra series, the usual Simon Belmont, and even Fuma from Getsu Fumiden. A map of the title universe is then displayed, which you'll be looking at in between each stage. The first of many stages, with various other Konami-based gameplay aspects, revolves around an auto-scrolling platformer similar to Sega's Altered Beast in which you take control of the aforementioned Rickle, the Red Super Robot, while his partner, Blue Rickle, is only present in the simultaneous two-player mode, guiding him through one scene after the next. Whilst doing so, as usual, you're wasting the shit out of every enemy in sight using his trusty laser blaster, collecting various power-ups, a first aid kit for health refills, an H-bomb to rid the screen of every incoming fuckface enemy, and the C-capsule, amongst others, which involves the aforementioned transformation method, and even double jumping via his rocket boots, similar to Monster in My Pocket, which Konami released the exact same goddamn year, hell if not long after. Upon obtaining the latter item, you can then transform into one of three characters, depending on which team you selected at the beginning. Simply push up and A simultaneously, like in the last game, obviously, and the character icon marked in red activates said tactic, like you've got Bill hence his rifle, Goemon hence his pipe, Simon hence his whip, Puma hence his katana, and finally, Upa himself with his trademark rattle. As one would expect, the trademark ability of your desired character is featured depending on who you've changed into. Take note, the duration of your character transformation is limited, albeit plentiful. In true Shatterhand fashion, your timer gets deducted whenever you take a hit. However, you can use those same first aid kits while transformed to recover and extend your duration. At the end of each trail of stages, as we'd yet again expect, a goofy as hell boss pops out of nowhere which must be defeated. Beyond that, a choice between a pair of roots, similar to once again, Konami's Castlevania 3, and even Contra Hardcore, Trico and UPL's Atomic Robo Kid, or even the Darius series by Taito, is imposed upon you, complete with a call from a familiar Konami icon about what's to be expected, whether it's Professor Cinnamon himself, Abisumaru, or Konami Man or Konami Lady. 
Those routes lead to an extra stage and or a bonus minigame, most of which are inspired by other Konami classics and hidden gems, including Roadfire, Twinbee, Falgen, the Gradius series, Frogger, and the like. Hell, there's even a title ranging bonus stage, reminiscent of Bart vs. the World by Acclaim and the infamous Imagineering. The basic yet alternating controls, depending on which type of stage you're in, are responsive and bug-free as always, and can take a fortnight, if possibly in less time to learn, despite how watered down the gameplay scheme is when compared to the previous entry, not to mention its sometimes stagnant pacing. Concerning Wild World 2's challenge, while this multi-variety follow-up is rather tolerable, there's actually a lacking element of some sort. Considering Konami's legacy of flawless, invigorating titles, one would expect a brand of kick-ass graphics and difficulty, the former of which will be discussed eventually. However, in the case of this game, it just about falls beyond flat on its ass. Now, I'm in no way ripping on every fundamental aspect, or hell, even the aforestated diverse bonus minigames and alternating gameplay features, but the former mentioned myriad of aspects is somewhat lacking due to the game's repetitive nature. Fuck, if only Konami put in a little bit more effort towards the enemy confrontation throughout various stages, this game would have held up as a solid sequel. All in all, not too intense, and not too disinclined, but damn it could have used a bit more tune-ups left and right. As far as graphics go, despite the overall character design, that is in the case of both the primary and supporting characters, especially the enemies and bosses they face, all being super adorable and chibi-fied? I mean, come on, it's from Japan, obviously! They're actually a sight beyond all means of inspiration, and the same story applies with the stages, notwithstanding the flat and repetitive nature of some of them. And just like every other old NES and Famicom game, not just those being made by Konami, this and the previous Wild World game included, the sprites tend to flicker a hell of a lot whenever there's a multitude of sprites displayed on screen. Nothing personal, but usually it's part of the console's limitations. However, that technical reaction in and of itself doesn't sabotage much of the game's combined purity and visual presentation in any form. In terms of music and sound as ever, composed this time around by yet another indestructible trio, namely Yuichi Sakakura, Kenichi Matsubara, and Satoko Minami, whose respective aliases are Milk Shop, Gentleman, and Muchi Muchi or Plump Pudding. Each and every song throughout, another slew of original new tracks, laced with revamped, ever-so-familiar stage tunes based on certain game universes, will, as always, satisfy you without any extent whatsoever, notwithstanding their lack of meaning. As for the sound effects, they're the same as in the previous entry, considering how they've been tweaked a lot, appealing yet tedious as always. My personal favorites would have to be the second scene where Rickles hovering in his mini-ship, the revamped Castlevania themes, namely Bloody Tears from Simon's Quest, and even the final boss from Castlevania 1, the revamped Jungle and Alien's Lair themes from Contra, and even a few revamped Gradius themes. And finally, for replayability, while both Wild World 1 and 2 don't have much to offer in the way of advanced innovations, they're both overlooked. One of the many reasons why they never hit the US in the first place. Unlike, say, the first Goonies game, in said case, it was only available via the PlayChoice 10 arcade machines throughout the country. But that's another fucking story. Hence, my potential soon-to-be-fulfilled opportunity towards covering both entries. Bottom line, as long as you're able to confront every common threat that lies ahead while looking past the simplistic-ass gameplay and neutral challenge, you won't have too goddamn much of a dilemma considering both games. Oh shit, no. So my final verdict on both YY World 1 and 2, if you consider yourself a die-hard, dedicated Konami addict and or import gamer, much like yours truly, you owe it to yourself to try this Overlooked as Hell series out, let alone track its rightful installments down, even at various online auctions, which will run you between 5 to 35 bucks for YY World, that is if it's loose, whereas if it's boxed, between either less or more than 90 bucks. Or for the second YY World game, if it's loose, it'll run you between 10 to 40 bucks. Or if it's boxed, 125 bucks, hell, if more or less. And since I'm dealing with two import games, you definitely need a converter for your NES. Though they're not the absolute best overlooked series of import games, the YY World series are rather exhilarating in my book, that's for sure. So what the hell are you waiting for? The next set of Funimation releases? Sniff them out already! As ever, you won't regret it, I assure you. And should I find myself unable to get to my next review, happy holidays and a kick-ass new year, and until then, this is the Hardcore Retro God signing off.